Um, I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. And it's always a blessing. And I'm so glad I did come to Cape Town. May the Lord bless you through these meetings. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3, and these are the words of the apostle. This second epistle, beloved, I write unto you, on both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. He doesn't want us to forget the words of the holy prophets and of the apostles. And then he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So he warns about a special kind of resistance to the gospel that will come in the form of scoffing, mockery. And, and what, I, what I'm seeing is it's a particularly sophisticated kind of mockery almost make you feel like a fool for believing that Jesus is coming, almost make you feel like a hater for not accepting something like homosexual marriage or the other politically correct um, false, falsehoods that are being pushed and shoved down people's throats. The mockers are very, very sophisticated. Now that's another subject for another time. They go, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So they ignore the flood deliberately, because the flood is the great sign of the judgment of God. By the way, uh, you know the end is very close, because Satan recently inspired Hollywood to come out with their own version of the story of Noah, which is a complete distortion of the real story. Don't, don't kid yourself. S Satan fears people actually believing in the flood and its implications. If people get the message of the flood, then they will turn and repent to God. The new ark is the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will run into him for safety. Now let me move on, okay? That was, uh, that was a, a side note, so don't put that on the time. And, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word kept in store, are reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Perdition's another thing the mockers are mocking, okay? There's a new kind of sophisticated mocker even infiltrating evangelical churches and making fun of the notion that a holy God will send sinners to hell. And uh, Rob Bell is a name that comes to mind, an evangelical preacher in America who went apostate and wrote a book called Love Wins. And the assertion is, how could a loving God send sinners to hell? That's uh, very important, okay? Verse 8, but beloved, don't be ignorant of this one thing. The one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is a very important verse, too. One of the most beautiful insights into the heart of God. The reason it's taken so long for these promises to be fulfilled has nothing to do with the slackness of God. It has everything to do with the mercy and love of God. And look what he says. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Now, the next verse says, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Um, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Now, I'm going to take a look at some of these prophets because Peter said, look at the words of the prophets. I want to read this passage first. But as you're turning to Hosea, I'm going to look at three Old Testament prophets tonight, Hosea, Joel, and Zechariah. As you turn to Hosea 3, here's part of my testimony. I became a Christian in the late 1970s. I was saved out of the Catholic Church. What started is I read, I read the Bible for the first time. The best way for Catholics to be saved is to read the Bible. I read the Sermon on the Mount. I came under deep conviction. 
And eventually I was born again into Christianity. I didn't know there was a whole world of Christianity. I thought everyone was either Catholic or Lutheran, okay, because I'm from Iowa. And there's not much uh, diversity there, all right? But I didn't know there was this whole world of the born again Christian world and this beautiful book that tells the end from the beginning and the details of life. It was incredible to me. And one of the things that was happening at the time I was converted was that everybody believed that Jesus was coming back. Everywhere you look, they're starting new churches called Maranatha Fellowship or Maranatha Music. Anyone know what Maranatha is? It's a heartfelt prayer in Greek. It means, oh, Lord, come. And man, did we want him to come. And that is 35 years ago. It was the late 1970s or maybe almost 40. I'm not sure. But nonetheless, I mean, everywhere you look, people are reading books like The Late Great Planet Earth. People are studying charts like Clarence Larkin's chart up there. People are very much into prophecy. And now you fast forward those 35 uh, years, and it's astonishing to me that uh, many Christians are oblivious to what's going on, have no idea what's coming, feel a little ashamed for believing uh, that there was going to come an eschatology, that Jesus was going to come back and that the end was going to come. I don't know what happened. Maybe they feel ashamed because they bought the book 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 88, and then they got into 1994, or maybe they actually still have shotgun shells in the basement from Y2K, but they, they feel stupid. Well, it's all right to feel stupid if you really were stupid, but that doesn't mean you flush Bible doctrine down the tubes. One third of the whole Bible is prophecy. The, God, the Bible is unique to any book that was ever written. It's the greatest book and the most accurate and sure book ever given because it's a revelation from heaven. In 66 books written over 1,500 years on three different continents, there's astonishing things in the Bible. For example, the precise predictions fulfilled to the, the smallest detail at the first coming of Jesus at the resurrection of Israel in 1948 and the ones yet to be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus. Now what I have found and I am trying to alert people all over the world is that there is, let me use modern vernacular, there are some high definition pictures of our day written in these prophecies that are thousands of years old. Unbelievably beautiful, high definition pictures that ought to alert people. See, the thing about prophecy, and that's why I read Peter first, is not just idle um, speculation or some interesting curiosity. There's a moral demand. You have to repent. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Prophecy should lead people to repent of their sins, turn to Jesus, break away from their sins, especially the most dangerous sins, the secret sins. Break off from your sins and run to Christ for refuge because a terrible judgment is coming to the face of the earth. Now let me get uh, moving here since I've got very limited time, but I'm going to do my best. Okay, Hosea chapter 3, what did the prophet see? Before I read the passage, the prophet Hosea lived in Israel and prophesied 700 years before Christ. Israel was the wife of Yahweh, the wife of God. That's what she's called. And yet Hosea saw that she was such a harlot and so intractable with her harlotries, committing idolatry every time that she could, that God was going to put Israel away. Okay. And he told them that. Look at verse 4. For the children of Israel shall remain many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice and without an image and without an ephod and without teraphim. The children of Israel shall remain many days without a nation, without a polity, without leadership, without a government, without a national symbol, without a temple, without a priesthood, without a sacrifice for a long, long, long time. Now, she would eventually go into 70 years of captivity in Babylon, as predicted by other prophets. But that's not what Hosea saw. Hosea saw something beyond that that would be many, the way he described it, many, 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 many days without any national uh, 
unity or land or religion, an organized religion without government. Okay, long time. And then he said, afterward, afterward. And we were, were curious about what, after what, and it, it'll become more evident as we read Hosea. Afterward shall the children of Israel return. Now, there's a Hebrew word, teshuva. There's a twofold meaning. Afterward, after the children of Israel remain many days without a king, without a prince, without a land, without a government, without a temple, without a national unity, without being in, even in their national borders, afterward, they will return. The first meaning of return is they will come back to where they came from. I wonder if people realize what a miracle happened in May 1948. I mean, it's astonishing. It's a staggering miracle. It's a billboard-sized miracle that tells the whole world, repent, get your life in order. Jesus is coming back. The judgment of God is coming to the world. And if that's all we had, no one would have an excuse for unbelief because what happened in 1948 has never happened before and will never happen again. What am I talking about? Well, I have a friend that's an evangelist in Australia, who had a T-shirt printed up with an, uh, a quotation from the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1911. It said, the likeliness of the Hebrew language ever being spoken popularly in the modern world is about as far removed as the likeliness that the Jews would ever return back to the land. Okay, well, God says, I will, make the, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And that's what he did with Encyclopedia Britannica, because within 35, 36 years of that quote, the Jews were back in the land, the Hebrews being spoken again, according to the word of the Lord. Okay. okay. It's massive. In fact, if you think about it, Israel itself is a miracle. The whole, the whole nation is a miracle. How did Israel start? Well, if you find their placement in the Bible, it's after Genesis 10 and 11. What happened in Genesis 10 and 11? Every nation on earth defected from God. Every nation on earth rebelled against God. We had a worldwide apostasy, the Tower of Babel, and God judged the, the nation by dividing people by language. And then he was going to make a new nation. So if you and I were going to make a new nation, we'd find a 20-something couple and say, go have a lot of kids and you'll be the seed for my new nation. But when God wants to make a new nation, he goes out and finds an 80-year-old man and his 75-year-old wife, and they're so far past childbearing years that she laughs at the thought of getting pregnant. He says, now there's a couple I can work with. They are a miracle. Isaac was a miracle. Okay, Jacob was a miracle. And not only that, everything in the world has tried to take him out. Their, pre their, their continued presence in the earth is a miracle. And perhaps even a greater miracle is that when the Romans killed a, a million and a half of them in uh, 70 AD and glutted the world's slave markets with Jews and spread the Jews literally from one end of the earth to the other, as Moses told them they would, that, uh, and then they, there they've stayed for the last 2,000 years, uh, and yet the idea that they're still intact. See, other nations have been obliterated, but they, they, they're not, never kept intact. Israel died. When the high priest of Israel said to the representative of the Roman government, we have no king but Caesar, that nation died. But God kept them in state. He entombed them in the Gentile world, but they kept their identity identity and integrity. That's a miracle. And then wonder of wonders, miracle of miracles. In one nation, in one day, a nation is born again. And Israel came back out of the tomb into the land. Now they're still spiritually dead. But that's what we're waiting for. See, look at this passage in Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. Afterward, shall the children of Israel return. The first return is physical, but this is a twofold return. We're waiting for the second. What will that look like? Oh, they will repent and seek the Lord their God and David their king, who the Messiah is the son of David. In when? In the latter times. Oh, are we ever in the latter times, beloved? Gosh, 
I didn't think it was going to be like that. I thought all the Christians would be so on fire as every prophecy came to pass. It used to be, but they're so asleep. It's frightening. Now let's read on what he says. They shall seek the Lord their God and his king in the latter days. Now go to Hosea chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This is Yahweh talking. This is the aggrieved husband talking to his wife who's become a harlot. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I even I will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go. Now this is an amazing Quotation, when you consider who's saying it. Verse 15. I will go and return to the place from which I came. Who's talking? God. How could God go anywhere? What do you mean, go back to the place from which you came? God's everywhere. Only in this sense... The holy God of the universe sanctified a piece of real estate in the center of Jerusalem and instructed the people to build him a holy house. And then he in his glory descended from heaven to inhabit the holy place of the house. We read of it in the book of Kings where the priest could not even stand to minister when the holy presence of God filled the house and animated the holy nation. And that nation became the only place on earth where God could truly be worshiped. And he came and dwelt among them. But the harlotry got so bad that the holy God said, I'm going back to where I came from. Now, Ezekiel saw this. Ezekiel saw the glory of God lift up from the holy place. And it lingered there, he said. Just like if a husband or a wife says to the other one, I'm fed up, I've had enough. But they don't leave right away, they wait. Maybe she'll change. Maybe he'll relent. So he lingers. But then he moved over to the Mount of Olives and he waited still. But finally, he ascended to heaven. Hosea saw this. Ezekiel saw this. And the Lord Jesus walked it out. Remember? In his last public manifestation as the Messiah of Israel to the leadership of Israel, he walks into the holy house of God and gives them a scathing sermon, among which he said, your house is left to you desolate. God doesn't live here anymore. And then he said, and you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Exactly what Hosea saw. I will go and return to the place from which I came. And then where did Jesus go when he left the holy house? To the Mount of Olives. That's, how, that's where we get Matthew 24. And then within weeks from the Mount of Olives, he ascended to heaven. See, this is the meaning of geopolitical events. This is what's happening in the world and with the nations. The Lord is going to bring his uh, holy people to the point where they admit their sin. I will go to the place from which I came and I will, uh, until you acknowledge your offense. Look what it says here. He says, I'll go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Now that word offense is singular. There's one offense, one sin. See, that's what the climax of human history is. He's going to bring his people back to himself. What's it going to take? The great tribulation. Look what it says in this verse. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me early. Affliction is another name for the tribulation. So is uh, night. So is the time of Jacob's trouble. So is 
Then Michael, the prince of your people, shall stand up, and there shall be tribulation such as the world has never seen before, nor will it ever see again. There's a lot of different words for the tribulation, but this is the real essence and meaning of the tribulation. I will go return to my place from which I came until you acknowledge your offense. Well, there's no chapter break in the prophet, so let me go to the next verse. Come and let us return to the Lord. Oh, the prophet turns to the nation and says, please, let's repent. Let's get this over with. Let's go back to the Lord. But then he's prophesying again. Let us return to the Lord. He is torn. He will heal us. He smote us. He'll bind us up. When? Verse 2. After two days. After two days. Remember, Peter said, listen to the words of the holy prophets. And then he quoted one, Moses. A day with the Lord is it's a thousand years. And a thousand years there is a day. And so Hosea says, when will he bind us up? When will he heal us? After two days, after 2,000 years. Can you believe that we're at the, almost the end of 2,000 years of Gentile domination of the holy people? Jerusalem should be trodden under foot of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. After two days, he'll revive us. And the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now, that for, the, for, for, for the, Jew, the Jewish aspect, 2,000 years of night, 2,000 years of alienation, 2,000 years of estrangement, 2,000 years of the curse of the law, 2,000 years of real, real agony until they return and then acknowledge their offense. Now, from a Christian perspective, there's another aspect to this, because I believe Jesus was uh, referring to this scripture when he, when he talked from a Christian perspective. For some of the Pharisees said, Lord, in Luke 13, did you know Herod's after you? And then Jesus said, look, you go tell that old fox. For two days, I'm going to be healing the sick and raising the dead. And in the third day, I'll be perfected in his sight. What's he saying? If the Jews have 2,000 years of alienation and night, the Christian church, Herod is always after us. If it's not Herod, it's Stalin or Mao or someone, okay? But that's not going to stop the Christian church from healing people and reconciling them to God. But we're not going to be perfected without the Jews and the Jews won't be perfected without us, as Paul said in the olive tree thing, okay? Now, let me move on to the next prophet. Go to the prophet Joel. Fortunately, he's right after Hosea. Joel chapter 3. Now, I picked up a newspaper article from a magazine. It's not Christian. It's not even Jewish, although it is Israeli. But, I mean, it's not spiritual. It's a secular news, Eretz Sheva. I don't know if you ever heard of Aretz Sheva magazine. And the headline said, the Sanhedrin to the UN. You're going to bring, uh, the, the Goldstone report is going to bring horrors upon the world. Boy, did that ever get my attention on so many levels. Wait a minute, the Sanhedrin, is that who I think it is? It was the Sanhedrin, the official body that condemned Jesus on behalf of the children of Israel. I thought they disbanded. Well, they did. They disappeared in AD 120 and never seen again. But according to this article, they're back. About five years ago, chief sages and rabbis got together and reconvened the Sanhedrin. This is huge. And then furthermore, they wrote a letter to the UN. Yep, they wrote a letter to the UN warning them because the UN, after the Lebanon War, uh, orchestrated a, uh, uh, an investigative report. They used a South African judge named Goldstone. And in this article, it says, your, your report is so biased and so vicious that you are in danger of bringing upon the world the horrors of Joel chapter 4. Well, wait a minute. There's only three chapters. Then I found out that the Jews divide Joel differently. Joel 3 is Joel 4. What were they warning the rabbis of? And this is, this is the rabbis were warning the UN, the only, the, the, the only Congress of every nation on earth. And they were warning them, you're going to bring on us the horrors of Joel chapter 4. Well, 
What exactly were they talking about? Well, you go to Joel 3 and we'll find out. He says, now, for behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Now listen closely. He gives us a time. Joel's got a lot of visions in there. I did a whole thing on Joel one time, but this one, this is the last one. It's looking at visions for prophets is like looking at mountaintops. I'm from the flatland, and you, you, you don't see mountains. So when I first went, I went to the Philippines and had a horrible experience there, uh, walking through the mountains for about six hours. And I thought, uh, they said, we're going to that mountain. I said, okay, that, should, that doesn't look that far, but it was way farther than I thought. And the closer I got, I realized, wait, in front of that mountain is two or three other mountains. I just couldn't see them. That's the way the prophecies were. You know, they see this and this and this and this and this. And then at the end, so they go all the way to the end. The vision of Joel. Behold, in those days and at that time when I will bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Well, at least he gives us a date. Sometime after May 1948. Because in May 1948 was the beginning of the return of the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Well, let me make another point while I'm here. Judah and Jerusalem always sounds redundant. Jerusalem is basically in Judah. Okay, why would you have to say Judah and Jerusalem? Well, because in the modern world, there are about a third of the time the UN spends deliberating over the borders of Israel, Jerusalem and its status, and Judah. Although you'd never know that because they don't even use the word Judah anymore. The word they use is the West Bank. But the West Bank is fake. That is what they say is the new country that they want to designate for the Palestinian Authority. But the biblical name for the West Bank is Judea and Samaria. So Judea is a very, very big thing. Now think about that. The UN, a Congress of every nation in the world, spends a third of their time deliberating a piece of land about the size of a postage stamp compared to the rest of the world. And it's split up into three things, Israel and her borders, and Jerusalem and its status, and Judea, which they want to designate for the Palestinian state, but which God has placed the Jews. Now it makes sense. Jews in Judea. All right. Now he says, in that day, I will gather all nations. Well, like I said, it's only been since about 1948 that this has ever been literally possible. In 1948, around the same time Israel became a nation, a new body was born, literally a Congress of every nation on earth called the UN. The UN is a very spiritual organization, but not positive spirituality. I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Well, let me stop this. I hope you don't mind my stopping and starting. For the young people, I mean, almost centuries ago, there was a relic called a cassette tape. And we used to love them because you could stop and rewind, all right? But uh, I know it's hard to believe. It's back in the days of the scroll. But I'm going to cassette this, all right? Stop the tape. He says, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, you should understand that on three levels. Number one, there is a geographical Valley of Jehoshaphat outside of Jerusalem. Number two, you're supposed to take note of the meaning of the name Jehoshaphat. For the name Jehoshaphat means Yahweh shall judge. And number three, I believe that you are supposed to take note of the story of Jehoshaphat which was a, a, another one of those stories frequently repeated in the Bible, where you've got Jerusalem, the only place on earth, in a pagan earth where true religion is practiced, and they are surrounded by a sea of paganism that wants to utterly wipe them out. That's the story of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat uh, called the day of prayer and fasting, and the nation gathered together, and it was a dynamic congregation because someone had a prophecy, and the prophecy was the battle is the Lord's, not yours. And then they, the Lord told them, put the praisers out front, remember? And the praisers went out to advance against the enemy, and by the time they got there, the enemy had fallen on each other, and all they had to do was remove the spoils. Well, Joel says, look, remember the Valley of Jehoshaphat? 
Remember the meaning of the name Jehoshaphat. And remember the day of Jehoshaphat. Has everything to do with this prophecy. In other words, Jerusalem's going to be surrounded again. People are going to be intent on wiping her out. Something so heavy is about ready to commence. It's unbelievable. Now let me move on. He says, I'll gather all nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will plead with them there. Stop the tape. If you're not careful, you'll use modern meanings to understand this. Because when we hear the word, I'll plead with them, that means someone's got their hat in their hand. They're going, would you go easy on my people? But that's not at all what this means. This is legal, technical language. The holy God of the universe is saying, I'm bringing all nations to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and I'm going to lay on them a lawsuit. I'm going to slap a suit on them as the judge of the earth. I'm going to bring charges against them. I'm going to confront them in the court of my holy law. Now, he gives a four count indictment. See how modern this is. Number one, because they scattered my people. And when I first read that, I thought, well, that was the Babylonians a long time ago. But God has shown me, no, it's been going on all along. Still goes on. In the height of World War II, Adolf Hitler uh, needed money. He actually offered to sell a million Jews to the West for two bucks a piece. You could, you could buy off the lives of Jews, keep them from the gas chambers for two million bucks. Not one nation took him up on it. A leaky ship took off from Bulgaria, Jews, out of Europe in 1944, the height of the Holocaust, and tried to find refuge on any other port. They went from port to port to port and were rejected by everybody. Finally, a Russian submarine sunk them, 900 people. After World War II, the British Navy ramrodded a ship of Holocaust survivors trying to get into the Israel, which was the British mandate. George Bush Jr. and Ariel Sharon evicted the Jews out of the Gaza, land that God gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That very week, a hurricane hit New Orleans that ruined his presidency, and Ariel Sharon went into an eight-year coma from which he never recovered. This is serious. There is a huge conflict going. Look, I could spend all night long giving examples of how the nations have scattered his holy people. Then the second count of the indictment, they said they have parted my land. See how modern that is. If I gave you a map, showed you a map of Israel, you would see a huge bite taken out of the little oblong diamond. Okay, a massive bite taken out of it, and that's supposed to be for the Palestinian Authority. That's called the West Bank, or the Occupied Territories. That's called that by the world, but God calls that Judea and Samaria, the heart of biblical Israel. The world is going to tell the Jews how many Jews can live in Judea. And then there's another little bite down there called the Gaza, which we evacuated the Jews, and I told you how that George Bush's presidency was destroyed. What did they do with Gaza when we evacuated it? Jewish businessmen, in compassion and mercy, said, you take my greenhouse business and thrive if I can. The, the savages destroyed them and made them into launching pads so they can shoot rockets at innocent people. I'm telling you, the God of the universe is taking names and compiling evidence. There's a terrible, terrible judgment coming to this world, and as an American, my knees are knocking. Our country's not exempt. Now let me go on to the third one. See how modern this is. They have cast lots for my people. A lot of us don't understand what that means because you've got to translate it into the modern vernacular. The modern vernacular for casting lots is voting for or against. Where do they do that? At the UN. <laughs> The largest uh, voting block in the UN is the Organization of Islamic Conference. They vote as a block, 57 states, okay? A third of the time in the UN is spent deliberating over this little tiny country. 
okay? They sit there and they go back and forth what the borders of Israel should be. How can we get them back before 1967? What, what, how are we going to get these settlers out of the occupied territory so we can start a brand new terrorist state? How are we going to, uh, uh, Israel, Judea, and, 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 um, and, and the boundaries of Israel? Oh yeah, the, the UN has cut Jerusalem in two. It's amazing. Okay, they cast lots for my people. I, I had statistics that showed that the, the, the UN had voted against Israel uh, compared to her Arab neighbors and to compared to people like Yasser Arafat, the father of modern terrorism. Uh, Israel itself, had, had, as of 2004, by one, one of the councils, had been voted against 457 times condemned, and Yasser Arafat never once condemned. This is, this is insanity. The man came before the UN with a pistol on his hip and a fatigues and his hands almost dripping with blood to a standing ovation. They cast lots for my people. They, they dare to vote. How many Jews can live in Judea? The Obama administration tried to apply a no natural growth policy to Ju Judea. I, I tremble because I believe in Genesis 12:3. Yes, someone said, what do you mean no natural growth? They said, we have a certain amount of Jews that can live there. And if a Jewish baby's born in the morning, then by evening a Jewish child, uh, adult has to go. No natural growth. Look, God sees this. This is the world fighting God. And then the last count of the indictment. See, if this isn't modern, it says that they gave a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Now this might be hard to understand, but let me see if I can't help. A boy and a girl, that's the innocent, right? That's innocence, okay? A harlot, a harlot is someone that sells everything near and dear to her. Now, nations have ideals. Let me just pick on my own nation. At the height of the Cold War with Russian missiles pointing at us, we're always preaching human rights. The Chinese outnumber us 200 million to, to, to something or other. We always preach human rights. No matter what, we always preach human rights. But when a Muslim blows up a bus in Jerusalem, or when terrorists steal a 15-year-old boy and slaughter him and then pass out sweets in the streets of so-called Palestine, or when a pizza parlor is exploded and then a square or a, or a uh, street is named for the murderer, the West all of a sudden gets quiet. They sell out their ideals. Why? Why? Oh, because God knew that the last days, human society would be highly technological and would be dependent for its lifeblood on a steady stream of oil. And as a moral test, he put the purest, cheapest, most easily accessible crude right underneath the sands of the most retrograde religion the world has ever seen. I hope you can see what the prophets saw. They looked ahead and saw our day and described it in detail. Look at the next verse. I could take you through this whole chapter, but I won't because I want to go to Zechariah. But look at this next verse. He says, Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon? See, I wrote a book in 2013 called A Sword on the Land and subtitled The Muslim World and Bible Prophecy. Muslims are important to God. God loves Muslims, by the way. Ishmael is, uh, has this distinction. He's one of four people in the Bible that was named by an angel. Okay. Another one was John the Baptist. Another one was uh, uh, Samson. Another one was Jesus. Ishmael is very precious to God. He's the son of Abraham too. Okay. Islam is a very big deal. One out of seven people in the world are Islamic. God has plans. This, the Bible tells you nations like Egypt are going to be saved. So is Assyria, which is Iraq and Western Syria. But the Bible also warns that many, many that are currently Muslim capitals will be destroyed by the time of the end. 
Damascus shall be a heap of rubble. Rabbah, which is now called Amman, Jordan, that's going to be destroyed. Cities in Saudi Arabia are going to be destroyed. I mean, God is, the old fight between Jacob and Esau is pulling the whole world in. Nobody can be exempt from it. That's the meaning of the tribulation. Now, let me, uh, let me go on. What have I to do with you, O Tyre and Sidon? In my book, what I do is I take these ancient names and update them. Because you've probably read that scripture a dozen times. Tyre and Sidon. Then you have this process. Ancient cities down there uh, in southern Lebanon. Okay, move on. Because <laughs> Tyre and Sidon were destroyed a long time ago, right? But wait a minute. This is in the days of the return of the captivity. So what's he talking about? Well, let's take a step back. Tyre and Sidon is southern Lebanon. What happened to Lebanon in our lifetime, starting in the 70s? That country, which once had this distinction, the only Christian country in the Middle East, was absolutely dissected by Islamic Jihad. The Christians fled to the south. I remember... Yasser Arafat had done extraordinary terrorism and then fled up to Beirut. And the Israeli Defense Force invaded Lebanon in 82. Remember that? And I could still see them. They had Beirut surrounded and the UN told them to stand down. And I could still see that ship with Arafat and his, his rats going to Tunis. And, and I can remember thinking, please sink the ship. <laughs> but they got away. And Israel held southern Lebanon for 18 years as a buffer for the Christian population. But they lost so many soldiers and it cost so much money that 2000, they said, told the Christians, find other arrangements. We've got to get out of here. And when they left southern Lebanon, there was a Shiite militia called Hezbollah who artfully shadowed them into the vacuum and became rock stars in the Muslim world because they made it look like they drove Israel out of southern Lebanon. And they have since been bombarding with impunity the cities and fields of Israel with rockets. Thank the Lord, the Lord gives them very little success. But good Lord, he addresses them in this context. Are you, what have I to do with you, Tyrant son? Are you gonna get revenge on me? And then he addresses Gaza. As soon as Gaza was vacated, that terrorist state became a client of southern Lebanon. They began to equip them with rockets to, in, with impunity, shed Jewish blood. Well, I could take you through the whole chapter, but I'm going to take you one more place instead. Zechariah 12. This is my last little high-definition vision of what's going on in our world and what the prophet who lived for Zechariah 500 years before Christ. Verse one, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord. Oh, stop the tape. See, the whole burden's for Israel. Amer Americans think everything revolves around America. So people go, is our country in, in Bible prophecy? I say, yeah, we're in Joel three. Okay, because he's going to gather all nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. All right. No, the burden is Israel itself. It's the dealing of God with his wayward wife. He suspended her for a while and dealt with all of the Gentile nations. That's why most of us are here. We're not Jews, but thank the Lord. If the setting aside of them be mercy and grace for the Gentiles, what shall the return of them be? but the resurrection from the dead for the whole world, all right? The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, and it says literally, who continually stretches forth the heavens and continually lays the foundation of the earth and continually forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. First of all, he says, I will make. In other words, whatever happens in the Middle East from here on, it's not ISIS, it's not America, it's not the Jews, it's not the, even the Muslims. It's God working. I will make Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. Do I have to repeat it? Yes, I do. Although most of you know it because you're Christian. Jerusalem is the most important city on earth. Now you consider it. It's the city, the only city, where God said, I would put my name there forever. 
God put his name, Jerusalem. That's huge. Whatever that means, that is massive. The only city of its kind. The only city where God dwelt among the people. The city where our Lord was crucified and dealt Satan his greatest blow. Jerusalem is an incredibly important city. Now, the Bible's realistic about it. If you go there now, you're not going to see much holiness. He, he says in the book of Revelation, it's called Sodom and Egypt, the place where our Lord was crucified. It's the center of the world, though. Think of the psalm, and I know you know this one. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised is the city of our God and the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion on the sides of the north? What's the last line? The city of the great king. Jesus quoted that psalm in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Don't swear at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by earth, for it's God's footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. But Jerusalem is a very important city to a lot of other people, too. It's the only city on earth that the UN has actually cut in two. Did you know the UN divided Jerusalem into east and west? God didn't, but they did. Can you see a conflict's coming? <laughs> Jerusalem's divided in two. The Obama administration actually rebuked the Jews for building housing in East Jerusalem. You can't do that. Who says? Jerusalem is the uh, mention more than 800 times in the Bible. That's obvious, right? Jerusalem is never mentioned by name in the Quran, and yet Muslims claim it is the third holiest city. There is one passage in the Quran that they say refers to Jerusalem. It never mentions it by name, but they say it refers to it. All right. Muslim scholars say that passage refers to it. It's the Isra. Anyone ever hear of the Isra? Oh, you, you need to brush up on your Quran, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the Isra is that passage where Muhammad got on a white horse and flew to the farthest places, Al-Aqsa, and he ascended to heaven and had a prayer meeting with Jesus and Moses. Now that's the Quran, that's not the Bible, obviously. Um, and that's the one verse they say, uh, the farthest place is Jerusalem. That's Al-Aqsa. That's why you have an Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. Now when the President of the United States, Obama, took power, he, he did something within the first year that was absolutely unprecedented. I never expected it, never seen it before, probably never see it again. The President of the United States went to Cairo, Egypt, Al-Azhar University, where he uh, gave a speech to the whole Muslim world. I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world, one based on mutual interest and mutual respect. The one thing I want to comment on is that in all that speech to the whole Muslim world, he only quoted one verse from the Quran. He cited the Israel. All of us have a responsibility to work for the day when the mothers of Israelis and Palestinians can see their children grow up without fear. When the holy land of the three great faiths is the place of peace that God intended it to be. When Jerusalem is a secure and lasting home for Jews and Christians and Muslims and a place for all of the children of Abraham to mingle peacefully together. As in the story of Isra. As in the story of Isra, when Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon them, joined in prayer. He cited the Isra. Now wrap your mind around this. In a speech to one out of seven, million, seven people in the world who claimed the third holiest spot is Jerusalem, he cited the only verse in their book that would affirm that claim. And look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2. Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. What is a cup of trembling? It's a national judgment. You can find it on your own in Isaiah 51. When God wants to judge a nation, he gives their leaders a cup of trembling. He makes them drink it and they go mad. 
Every decision they make is counter to the national interest. It's absolutely bizarre the way the Lord, when he wants to judge a nation, can, can make their leaders absolutely crazy. And he says, Jerusalem itself will be a cup of trembling to the nations round about. Now think about it. Who are the nations round about? Well, you got Jordan, you got Lebanon, you got Syria, you got Egypt, you got Saudi Arabia, you got Iraq, you a little bit further out, you got Yemen, you got Libya. Uh, talk about a tough neighborhood, okay? Because every one of them hates the very existence of Israel. It's an affront to the Quran, which has a doctrine that says once Muslims take a land, it's theirs forever, okay? The very existence of Israel is an affront. And those nations were basically uh, pressed into an order after World War I and World War II by the Western powers. Basically what they do is put minority people in charge. It's very devious and unfortunate, but that's what they did. So for example, in Syria you have uh, the Alawite uh, is a sect of Shiite, a very small sect, but the Basar Assad and his father, Hafez, were Alawites. By putting a minority in charge, then that person in charge has only one concern, survival, <laughs> because of the forces they have to subdue. So that, that keeps them from getting into other trouble. You see what I'm saying? And so what they do is uh, they had a lot of leaders in the Middle East, even through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, were not rabid, uh, Muslim terrorists. They were very hard-headed secular realists who knew what they had to do to keep power. Now, I wouldn't want to live under Mubarak of Egypt or Saddam Hussein, but you got to give this to them. They didn't have an official policy of persecuting Christians. Now, what's happened in the last three years, and that's why I wrote my book, something called the Arab Spring. All the nations round about as a change is occurring from Tunisia, Morocco, all the way to the immediate Arab Muslim world, the, those secular leaders have been displaced. The West has pulled the rug right out from underneath them, and they're being replaced in many cases by extreme Muslim Brotherhood fanatics. That's how we got ISIS. That's how we have Syria about ready to be utterly destroyed. That's how we have the mess in Egypt where the, the, the man was elected and then immediately his brutality was so great the Egyptian uh, army had to take power back. Okay, we got a mess. That's how Libya, Gaddafi was giving everyone in the country a check of their oil revenue. He was making sure people got education. He surrendered his nuclear weapons and helped us in the war on terror. But unfortunately with, with the West uh, these days, no good deed goes unpunished. He was murdered. People pulled a rug out from underneath him. And now Libya is a nightmare. Now the only thing that consoles me is, if you read the first part of this verse, I am doing this. Why? Because his plan for the Middle East wasn't that secular leaders hold back these powers forever and have some kind of sane stability. No. His plan is different. These nations get to express their true character. Arab Spring, that's a bad metaphor. More like take a bottle of champagne and shake it so hard and then pop the cork and outrush forces that long suppressed that you'll never get back in the bottle again. The only one that can help us is Jesus. Man. Let me go just a little further. I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the people round about when they will be in the siege. Now you go to the grocery store in Europe, the fruit section, and they mark the fruit specially so you won't have to buy fruit from the evil Jews, but from the Palestinians. Mobs march through grocery stores in London, England, trashing kosher departments saying, Jews, get out. Jews are leaving France saying, this feels like 1938. An anti-Semitic madness is gripping the world. Zechariah saw it. They will be in the siege, both against Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, let me say something else. I talked about Jerusalem. But notice he makes that distinction, Judah and Jerusalem. 
When Jesus gave the definitive statement on the end times in the Gospels, it's Matthew 24. They say, what shall be the sign of thy coming, the sign of the end of the age, and when shall these things be? First thing he does is he speaks about things that are universal. There'll be deception, there'll be false Christ, false prophets, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be wars, there'll be rumors of wars, there'll be famines, there'll be pestilences. Where? Everywhere. All of a sudden it gets local in verse 15. He says, then let those which are in Judea, when they see a certain sign spoken of by the prophet Daniel, then let those who are in Judea flee. Don't go back to your house even to get your cloak. See, something so bad is going to happen, triggered in Judea, so horrible, that the Savior is speaking to people 2,000 years ago, the people that live there now, the settlers. There's about 600,000 Jews in Judea. And they're hated by everyone. But Jesus loves them. And they don't believe in him. But he says, look, when you see the sign of what Daniel spoke of, the abomination that makes desolate, don't even go back in your house to get your coat. You run and pray to God that it's not in the winter and pray to God that it doesn't happen on a Sabbath day when everything's closed and women pray to God that you're not pregnant when this happens. He says, for then there will be great tribulation such as the world has never seen before, nor will it ever see again. Something horrible happens in that so-called West Bank. Something so bad that the Jews flee. They go and relive the Exodus. The next verse, that day I'll make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. Remember, first it was for the near neighbors. Now it's for everybody. I told you, Jacob and Esau had a fight a long time ago, and everybody gets sucked into it in the end. Okay. In the last days, everybody takes a side. But you know what's scary to me? Uh, people are turning toward Esau to justify Esau to overlook Esau, to condemn the Jews, to call them thieves. There's a new anti-Semitic wave. And the scariest thing is, it's coming into the evangelical church. It's very frightening, okay? All nations will get into this. You can't avoid it, he says. It'll be a burdensome stone for all people. Well, the way I look at this vision, the, the kings of the earth and the rulers, of which the Bible has a lot to say, they want to make the world into a new place. And what they want is a godless utopia. They want, with technology and everything, a Western civilization without God or Christ, especially. That's what Psalm 2 says. So they're almost there, though. They're marching down the Yellow Brick Road. And it's right around the corner, only there's a great big rock in the way. Jerusalem. Well, you've got to appease the Muslims. So I'll just pick on my own country. Uncle Sam says, I'm a problem uh, solver. So he rolls up his sleeves. I'll move this stone. But Zechariah said, whoever tries to move it will be lacerated. They'll be cut to the bone. I have an article on my blog, The Laceration of Two Presidencies, in which I documented presidents that were on their way to the pantheon of American presidents. The things they weathered, the way they went through, they were always going to be considered the greatest until they tried to solve this problem. And now they're in disgrace. It's really frightening. Where's this all going? Well, I'll tell you where it's headed. You know, all of Israel's wars, uh, we looked at 1967 and we were blown away, the Six Day War. And a lot of people came away saying, oh, the IDF, man, that's the greatest army in the world. Well, I agree, they probably are the great, great army, pound for pound and person for person. But the IDF is not the savior. God is the savior. God has saved Israel and God has preserved Israel. But every war gets worse. Okay, the Yom Kippur War almost wiped them out. It was a total surprise. It was Israel's highest holy day. Egyptian tanks penetrated. They were almost in Jerusalem. It was unbelievable. And that was 74. And at that time, the supplier for the, the Jews was France. And Golda Meir had a shopping list ready for tank parts and spare plane parts. You know, hot war, you need that stuff now. She called the French and said, we need this, 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 this. And they go, you're on your own. 
because they were doing a new Arabization thing. She called Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. He said famously, let the Jews bleed a while. But then she did something that I'm so grateful for. She went over his head and called President Richard Nixon, a man reviled by the world, but personally I love him, if nothing else, just for this. She said, we are up against the wall. We need these parts so bad. He said, Goldie, when I was a boy, my mother used to read the Bible to me. And one day she looked up from the pages and said, Dick, if you can ever help the Jews, do it. And he sent an airlift of parts and they came in and the nation was saved, not by Nixon, by God. That's a beautiful vignette. Now, how bad is it going to get? The day is going to come when Jerusalem itself will be overrun by the savages. I'm no prophet, but that's what the Bible says. If you look at Zechariah 14, it's a prophecy to Jerusalem. I will divide thy spoil in the midst of you. The nations of the world will come against you. They shall ravish your women. They shall rifle your houses. They shall overrun you. Half the city shall be taken into captivity. I used to ponder, half, half. Why half if they overran the city? Then I remembered the prophet lived 500 years before Christ, but he knew that the UN cut the city in half by the Spirit of God. That is what is going to bring Jesus, back to this earth. It says in the next verse, then the Lord shall rise up and come to them as one that fights a battle. But remember I told you earlier, Hosea said, no, they got to acknowledge their offense first. So what happens immediately before the Lord rises from the throne? In Zechariah 12, 10, it tells you what happens. They're back against the wall, the city overrun, the people reliving the exodus, unless they're captured by savages like ISIS. Women raped, houses ravished, people murdered. Suddenly, to the beleaguered nation, he comes to them. I will pour out upon the house of Israel and the house of David a spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. Jesus comes to them. This is foreshadowed by Paul. Remember, Paul hated Jesus. He said, I thought I'd do everything against the name of Jesus. Until one day Jesus came to him. He said, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you persecuted. How about the, that's the typical Jew, right? Or how about Joseph's brothers who hated Joseph and they think they're dealing with an Egyptian. You know, the Jews think Jesus is a Catholic. They don't even know he's a Jew. They think they're dealing with an Egyptian. And finally he puts everyone out of the room and he takes off his Egyptian headgear and they go, it's you? They look on him whom they betrayed? You? Can you imagine the whole rethink of everything that had happened? That's the climax. That's what happens at the end. He comes to them and they look on him whom they pierced and they mourn for him in such a profound way. Not a national mourning, an individual and personal mourning. Everyone by themselves. And in closing, the morning shall accomplish two things, according to Zechariah 13. It shall open a fountain for cleansing for Israel. Finally, the removal of the national sin. Finally, the redemption of the chosen nation. Finally, the reinstatement of the priest. Finally, the best player on the team takes the field. Right. If their sins are washed away, he says, I will open up a fountain of cleansing. It's a fountain you and I are all too familiar with. For I know this church sings... There is a fountain filled with blood, Amen. drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. And in closing, the fountain shall accomplish one other thing, which I so thank God for. It shall quench the spirit of false prophecy that has long blinded and bedeviled the chosen people of God. Thank you for your attention and the grace of God be with you.
In the first place, my first answer is you, um, that is abominable no matter how that happens. And nobody is saying that Israel is even saved yet. They're not. They're third, uh, the third thing I would say is I would invite you to read a book that was very well written by a secular person, not a Christian, not a Jew, not a Muslim, called From Time Immemorial. And what it was was Joan Peters, she just recently died, was a, a leftist journalist who wanted to go and tell the whole story of the atrocities of Israel. This is in the 70s. And instead she wrote a book that was almost the opposite because of her research. Basically, uh, number one, the Jews had a policy, even as of May 1948, to the Arabs, stay here with us and build. You can be part of our nation. Arabs have as many rights, if not more rights in Israel as they have anywhere else in the world. They've always had that policy. Number two, um, the, 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 really, the draining of the swamps and the reforestation of Israel started in the 1880s, and many Arabs moved in to work for them. A lot of Arabs, you're right, they owned that land for thousands of years. They were, uh, when, when the um, five Arab armies were going to come in 1948 and dispossess the Jews, and they promised to drive them into the sea and obliterate them, the Jews were going through the streets saying, don't leave, stay here. We can build a new nation together. But the Arabs were saying, vacate your homes, and then when, uh, when we take over and drive the Jews in the sea, you come right back in, and you will possess the land. Well, they believe the Arabs, and there's, uh, there are refugee camps that the Arab world refuses to repatriate. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. When, when, when the Jews came into Israel in 48, more than a million Jews left the Arab world with nothing. They had to leave all their wealth and everything, they, and then they were assimilated into the, the Jewish nation. The Arab world refuses because they know that that's a festering sore to repatriate these people that they said, look, we'll drive the Jews in the sea and then you can take over the land. R look, all, all I can say is, look, I'm not going to defend the, the behavior of the Jews. I'm, I'm looking at what God is doing. God has brought them back into that land. The Jews paid for the land and they repaid for the land. The, the, you, the, in this account of Joan Peters, you, you got documentation of, of, of Jews buying land. See, what happened is the Turks had the Ottoman Turks had the control of that whole area. They put a tax on trees, okay? So these people didn't want to pay for every tree on their property, so they cut down the trees and they made it into a desert, all right? The American author Mark Twain wrote a book, and he's no Christian. In fact, he's an atheist, but he wrote a book. He says, you can't see anyone from miles around. There's almost nobody here. It's a desert. It's a swamp. It's a, it's, it's a fetid swamp, he said. I go miles and miles and miles. There's no settlements. There's no nothing, okay? Now, that doesn't mean he covered every square inch of the, of the thing, but look, there's a lot of propaganda out there. And that Goldstone report, if you're referring to that from June 2006, I, look, everyone has to choose for themselves what they're going to believe. There's an incredible amount of propaganda. But when you have a culture, let's, let's put it this way, brother. When you have a culture where you take babies and put fake dynamite belts around them and parade them down the streets, or when, when the West pours money in for education so they create a Mickey Mouse show where Mickey Mouse teaches them, to the children, I want to bathe in the blood of the Jews because they're apes and pigs. Uh, they bring a lot of their misery on themselves. Like uh, Golda Meir said, There'll never be peace in the Middle East until the Arabs learn to love their own children more than they hate ours. And another one of the Arab politicians, I believe it was, said, we never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a complicated problem, and I'm not saying there's saints on one side and devils on the other. I'm just saying this is what God's doing. I do appreciate your compassion. I don't think we should ever lose that. But having said that, Leviticus says, the land is mine. I determine who's going to live there and who doesn't. God told the Jews, have this policy toward foreigners where you welcome them. Well, in 1948, they did. They said, don't leave. Please don't leave. The Arabs that believe them are still there with all full rights. There's Arabs in the Knesset. The Arabs that believe their Arab brethren have been stuck in refugee camps for 40 years. And I hope that's helpful, brother. 
Yes, sir. What you're saying is right, that we have to be awake, aware, and vigilant and get our act together. You're right. But his coming back is not contingent on that because he said, when I come back, there'll be people asleep. There'll be people not ready. So his brother's exhortation is right. But um, no, the Lord's coming back when he's going to come back. You're right. Yeah, we got to pray. And, and also, another thing I, I urge in my book, pray for the Muslim people and love them. Love them. They're dear to God. Thank you, brother. Anybody else? Blood moons. Um, yeah, look, here's the thing. I don't believe that it's possible for there to be um, astrological, astronomical phenomenon on the beginning and the end of Jewish feast days, two years in a row, and that to have no significance. The Jewish feast days are called appointments. God says, I get, these are my appointments with history, and, and everything that he's done significantly in history are associated with them. Having said that, I dare not speculate what it is. I don't know. I don't know the meaning of it. But yes, there is such an astro astronomical phenomenon. I and I believe it, having started on Passover one year and then uh, the Feast of Tabernacles and Passover, that's amazing to me, of some significance, but I don't know what. Anybody else? Oh, brother back there? You know, brother, you're right. Genesis 12, 3 is a very important verse. It says, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And we do have a righteous God, and he is a God who judges and who sees what's going on in the world, and he is not inactive. So that's a good point. Yes, sir. No, unfortunately not. No, xenophobia is not unique to South Africa. I believe, I believe so, although um, I can only link it loosely that, in, in the, that as in the days of Noah, so shall be the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And one of the characteristics of the days of Noah was violence. But xenophobia is nothing more than uh, resentment and, and jealousy. And also uh, you can throw in there, you know, bad policy by government because I'm not going to get into all that, but we ourselves are turning our borders open and that causes all kinds of problems. Look, God is the one that divided the nations. Borders are of God, okay? Someone should be controlling it. But our kings of the earth and the leaders want to make a brave new world without borders. Remember, Paul said in the book of Acts 17, he divided the nations that they might seek him. Okay, there's a reason why nations have divisions. It's not all bad. All right. Yes, sir. ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant. Uh, what they are doing, uh, they are, number one, they said themselves, they are trying to undo what we did to the Middle East after World War I. They were trying to remove those borders, and they want to establish something called a caliphate. And that's the Sunni world has a caliphate, which means one central leader of the Muslim world. There was a caliphate until after World War II. It was centered in Turkey, and it was disbanded because Turkey took the wrong side in the war. And many, many Sunni Muslims want that caliphate restored, okay? That's what they're trying to do. And to the, to, the, to the Muslim world, there's only two boundaries, okay? There's the house of peace, which is the Muslim world, and the house of war, which is the rest of the world. So they, they're not so much nationalistic, you know? They don't, they don't understand nation. They believe in the Ummah, okay? So like an Iraqi is not necessarily an Iraqi. That's artificial. That was done by the West, okay? Iraqis got Sunnis, uh, Kurds, and Shiites. See, see, the big thing to understand, too, in the, in the Muslim world is the Sunni-Shiite rift, okay? The fact that Iran now possibly has a nuclear access, nuclear bombs, has Saudi Arabia terrified. 
Because if you think that the average radical Muslim hates the West or hates Israel, that's nothing compared to the hatred they have for each other among the Sunnis and Shiites. It's unbelievable, unspeakable, and it's also a fulfillment of prophecy because God said that Ishmael would never be able to get along with anybody and not even with himself. The end of money, look, you got stuff like identity theft going all over the world. It's massive and rampant. You got hacking and stuff like that. Look, I do believe that you know, there's some design in all this, that they've been wanting to phase out money for a long time. And I do believe that there's a technology for a chip, which would be what you saw predicted in Revelation 13 that would become the mark of the beast. And I can't emphasize enough, although it seems obvious, I cannot emphasize enough, never, ever, ever participate in a chip or a mark on your hand or your forehead. Right. It would be better to die than to do that. In that day, angels will fly through heaven warning people, don't do this. If you do this, you cannot be saved. The reason I'm saying this now is that unfortunately, evangelical preachers in America are coming out and giving people comfort, saying, well, you know, if you did take the mark, you could be forgiven. Look, when angels are telling you not to do it and saying the smoke of your torment will go forever, when the gospel comes in its last form in Revelation 14 with angels saying, fear God and worship him, and if anyone takes the mark, they can't be forgiven. I'd believe them over some evangelical money preacher or preacher in America. So anyway, that's, that's all I know about it, dear brother. Good questions. But, but I'm, I'm warning you, it'll sound reasonable. It'll look good because, hey, money, you know, identity theft is huge. And people are hacking into computers right and left. I mean, it's just unreal. You can't keep anything anymore. So it'll be, hey, we'll put it all there and no one can take that from you. All right. And people, uh, be, beware because there'll be religious uh, and even so-called pseudo-Christian leaders stepping up and saying, come on, let's be responsible and just take this, all right? Don't do it. They'll make fun of us. Remember he said they'll mock us? Yeah. Don't do it. Yes, sir. So I'm just curious, what, what about the chip would make prevent you from being sick? Uh, well, it's not the chip. It's the reception of the chip. Because, it's, because, because the, the presumption of the chip is that nobody can buy and sell unless they receive this mark of the beast, okay? It's a numbering of the people, all right? It's exactly like in Jesus' first coming when uh, the Caesar wanted to number all the people, okay? He was the God of the earth. This is his flock. He's going to put a number on each, just like a shepherd would with a sheep or a farmer. And so uh, I don't, I, so, so the whole notion that you are underneath that is abominable to God. And he actually calls it worship, that no one received the, 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 the mark, the number, or the worships the beast. And he says that those who refused to receive it overcame the beast. So we have to overcome the beast. But I'll tell you another thing about the mark of the beast, if you don't mind, it'll take it a few more minutes. Look, um, it's on the hand and the forehead, right? Okay, look, that's the last stage of a process. Okay, the forehead, that's where you think. See, people are already being conditioned to think a certain way. Government's the answer to everything. Government is God, okay? And people are already being conditioned to do certain things with their hands. They're already going that way. In other words, I'm saying spiritually, people, many people already have the mark. It's not irreversible, though, until you actually take the last step. You get this great new system that's going to break crime and it's going to show that we're all united and that this guy here that's leading us is really taking good care. You know, who is like the beast? And so you say, yes, I'll be the first. And when you do that, okay, then you cannot be saved because you have just worshipped a false Christ, a false God. Yeah, you ask a good question. Can you unknowingly do it? Let's say someone did it to you while you were sleeping. I don't think that would damn you. Okay, I think it's you doing it. It's you submitting to it. So say, say someone takes a chuck, but they don't realize, okay, that's peace and they're believer. 
Well, I don't know. I, see, that's the problem. There's going to be warning according to Revelation 14. Yeah. There is going to be really strong warning. So in order to do this, you'll have to overcome a lot. But look, Christians are overcoming a lot of things now. There are churches that are overcoming the ages-old rebuke of homosexuality. Why? Because the modern age has changed, so we've got to change with it. People are already getting used to overcoming Scripture and the Word of God. And that is the trend that is going to lead people to do the unthinkable. It's already unthinkable to me that there's a Chrislam movement or that there are gay churches or there are gay marriages. That's, are you out of your mind? But yet it's conditioning. It's been happening for a long time. Anybody else or anyone previous? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm sure the Antichrist is probably a figure that we might already be familiar with. I don't know. I'm sure he's around. I have no doubt. Look, because, because it's the rebirth of Israel that's, the, the, re, that's the, the, the watershed moment. Thank you for your patience, everyone, by the way. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for faith and assurance and love uh, out of this message, out of this word. I pray for awareness. I pray for repentance. I pray that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit, as our brother suggested, get ourselves together and look up for our redemption draweth nigh. I pray for love and compassion on people suffering too, Lord. I pray that we would be everything that you are and were, that as he is, so are we in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone.